evening and welcome to Shri Memorial Library virtual, uh, virtual author chat. Shri Memorial Library hosts the virtual author chat each first Thursday of each month right here at 630. And uh, we are so happy that you guys have joined us tonight. And tonight we welcome Dr. Tyrone Burton. Uh, Dr. Burton is the author of Reframing, The Reframing of American Education and More Than a Notion. Dr. Burton is a former Caddo Parish principal who is who now serves as a school turnaround specialist and is the CEO and founder of Passion Driven Leadership, a leadership uh, development company. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, tonight we are proud to welcome Dr. Tyrone Burton. And we're going to get right into this. Um, Dr. Burton, you've got two books here. Uh, tell us a little bit about both of them and uh, why you decided to write these books. Thank you, Ivy, first of all, for having me. And uh, I appreciate the opportunity. And let me say uh, how proud I am of all the, uh, the men and women who serve as essential workers in our schools right now. They really are doing an impossible job and making a very impossible job look very, very easy. So kudos to all of them. Um, I had, after I... Uh, finished the principalship and finished my doctorate, I began writing uh, the book called More Than a Notion. And that book is uh, how to navigate the, the vicissitudes of accountability from the standpoint of a principal. And so it was written just for principals or administrators or of those who are aspiring administrators. Um, the second book, and that book was to be released spring of last year, COVID hit. So when COVID hit, uh, my uh, publisher suggested that I put the book on hold. That's a good thing she did. Well, while I was sitting at home with the rest of the country during COVID, Floyd uh, George, the incident happened. And when that happened, something just rose in me. And I felt compelled to write the book that we're going to talk about tonight, which is the reframing of American education. It's how education should look post-COVID-19. And what is that? Well, I talk about uh, several things. One is uh, governance and leadership. Uh, the second chapter talks about equity and equality. We talk about standardization or the lack of standardiz standardization. Talk about teacher quality. Talk about the reopening and the resocialization socialization of schools. And then the clarion call. At the end of every chapter, there was a reflection piece. And people ought to write what, they, what they've learned, how they feel, and what they're going to do. As John Lewis said, it's time for us to get in good trouble. And the key is unity is our strength and diversity really is our power. So if we work together, we can be the solution to our own problem because education in, in our country, it's fractured. We have two systems of education, those for haves and those for have nots. The good thing is we can fix this problem. Yes, and I believe that leads us to chapter two where you talk, where you talk about um, uh, equal and equitable funding for all the haves and have nots. What, what would that look like in, I guess you say, a um, ideal situation? That's a great question. I'm gonna back it. We're gonna back it and pick up leadership after that. Uh, e we talk about equality and equity. Equity means, simply means that the schools that need the most get the most, not just in funds, but in resources. For instance, uh, all schools should have access to foreign languages to all the arts all the time. Um, you know, the, and, and in terms of access to personnel, especially since COVID-19, our boys and girls and even our staff, and what I suggest in the book is that there should be on campus, not just someone to call, but on campus, a counselor, a social worker, psychologist, uh, a behavior interventionist, as well as assistant principal and principal. All those things should be on campus all the time because our boys and girls need that support, particularly now post COVID-19. Mm -hmm. uh, why, why do you say that matters? Well, it matters because uh, in education, I think our prime directive is to increase life chances for all children. And we know that uh, some children come to school under resourced academically and socially. So some of our boys and girls need more help and support and guidance to get to where they need to be. And again, that's part of equity. That means that those boys and girls and yeah, those schools that need the most resources, get the most resources. It's easy for, for districts to give out equal amounts of money, which means everybody gets $5. But 
But equity means that those schools that need the most get the most in every aspect of what they need. Now, wow. let, me, let, me just, let, me just, let me just qualify that because the first chapter talks about leadership. And one of the quotes I say in the book is that not everyone that has leadership ability, which is a skill, necessarily has leadership capability, which is a will. A lot of folks have positions, but don't have the will to do what's right, rightful and righteous for all children all the time. And just because they have the position doesn't mean they have the power to get it done. So it means putting leaders in place and holding them accountable for doing the right things for all folk all the time at every level. Wow. Uh, how, how do you, how would you say that, uh, I guess, a school system can achieve that? Because it's kind of like putting the right people on the right bus. And holding them accountable all the time. You know, and, and let me go back to that phrase, increasing life chances for children. Um, in most states, school officials are appointed, some they're elected. And the, the key is, uh, the litmus test is what kind of results are they getting? That's the bottom line. If they aren't getting results in the positions that they're in, then we need to question them. The most powerful people in the school system are the parents. The parents, uh, board members answer the parents. Uh, and everybody above the board and below the board answers the parents. Parents have a lot of say-so. And in some communities, parents uh, re realize their power and they talk to board members who talk to superintendents who, who make things happen. And it, it means those of us who are in communities who are under-resourced or uh, academic and socially or who are deprived coming together because unity is our strength and um, diversity is our power. If we come together, we can really make some changes, but it means each of us holding them accountable, looking at the results, you know, and if, if there's some disparity there and the data informs us that there's disparity there, then we need to hold them accountable to making changes. If you look at the accountability system that George Bush started in 2000, there was no child left behind, and we've had versions of it since then, the accountability mainly rests at the school level. And I'm not saying, you know, that's wrong or right, but what I'm saying is that in systems that really get it right, there was accountability from the top to the bottom, from the superintendent to the custodian and everyone in between. That means everyone is held accountable for their piece of the pie, making sure that we're doing what's right, rightful and righteous for all children all the time, which means taking care of our teachers as well. Mm -hmm. Right now, our teachers are working in, in situations that are impossible and they make it look easy. You know, hospital people are frontline workers and they, they go and they get all the accoutrements of PPPs and everything they're supposed to have. And teachers go to work every day and do uh, a phenomenal job, sometimes with masks, sometimes with kids who don't come with masks. You know, when teachers are supposed to distance themselves, but when teachers really teach, they come toward kids and they do, th they, they, they do the impossible. And, you know, the sad thing is in most states, we are considered frontline workers so we don't get shots. You know, so uh, we, they, they do an impossible job of making it very, very easy. Which, and I talk about that in the book where I talk about teacher quality. Although I put it in the capsule of professional development because professional development shouldn't be one size fits all. It should be uh, that that the teachers need to grow. Mm -hmm. Well, now, I think there is a big controversy uh, right now about teachers and the vaccine. Do you mm -hmm. think that they should be part of that first round of people that receive the vaccine? It, it depends on the state. In some states where they have uh, big lobbies and big unions, uh, they are, I think, tier two, like in New York. You know, teachers, are, I think, are getting can, can get the vaccine now. And the thing is, Ivy, the, when, when, the, when this thing first hit, there was no, and let me repeat, no comprehensive plan from the government. And because school is run by government, governor said, state superintendents, get it done. So state superintendents said to local superintendents, get it done. Local superintendents said to principals, get it done. And they got, and teachers, they told teachers and, and, and they got it done because there was no comprehensive plan. It, it looked different in every state. Now, thank God, uh, in November, our country pressed the reset button. And now we're repositioning ourselves to do some great things. President Biden has a comprehensive plan that, 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 that addresses not just COVID-19, but all the layers that happened as a result of being aligned to success for the country and for schools and for everyone. Doesn't mean we still don't have problems, but there's a plan in place to fix it. Wow. 
Um, I'm reading a quote from your book that says, the educational system is full of activities, but has very little progress. Uh, kind of explain what you mean when you say that. Yeah, let, let, me, let, <laughs> let me restate. Uh, activity and progress are two different things. Activity often masquerades at progress, but only progress gets results. Unfortunately, in, in my profession, there are a lot of things going on. We have, a lot of, we have a lot of things going on. But the question is, again, what type of results are we getting as a result of those things going on? That's what progress is. And that's what we should be holding leaders and everyone accountable for is progress. Not just stuff happening. Stuff happens all the time. But what is it benefiting the children and the communities? We know that's why, you know, one of the quotes I have in the book is that parents can no longer tolerate have and have not schools because have and have not schools result in have and have not communities. You know, so that whole notion of activity versus progress is a sound uh, doctrine that we need to adhere to all the time because there really is a difference. Chapter three, you talk about the case against standardization. Talk about that. Wow. You know, um, one of the premises in the book is that I suggest that COVID-19 and racism are two sides of the same coin. I also suggest in, in the introduction that uh, America is, is a system of have and have nots. And there are two systems in America, those for haves and those for have nots, which reflects America overall. And one of the things that, uh, in, according to my research, has uh, kept the divide between have and have nots, one of those vehicles is standardization. You know, it started with No Child Left Behind. And, you know, we gave out, uh, schools got labels. The test was very simple. And then it progressed to numbers. And now we have alphabets. And the thing is, going back to that equity, because things are not done equitably, schools that, that need the resources to get those things done often don't get the proper resources. They get things, but not the right resources to help the boys and girls who are under-resourced academically and socially. So that divide stays right there. And so in some places you have uh, schools that are fixed with A's and B's and some schools that are fixed pretty much, you know, D's and C's and then, then you have your bubble schools. I never will forget uh, John White, when he first became superintendent, he's not superintendent now, of Louisiana State Superintendent, he said that there would uh, always be an equal number of A, B, C, and D and F schools. Now, how could he say that his first time in office, he could say that because the accountability system is built such that for standardization, it keeps that divide there. Now, can it be beat? Yes, it can. It can easily be beat and overcome if, again, those who lead have the compunction to do what's right, right and right, righteous for all kids. Wow. Uh, you also talk about teachers left behind. Yeah, unfortunately, uh, if you look at the history of when they were doing... Uh, Standard, the standardized test, and, you know, it's, it's called different names now. The group that they talked the least to were teachers. And you would think if they were doing a standardized test that was going to be nationally known, it would, it would, you, would, you would address teachers. And I mean, the truth is, uh, back before we had standardized tests, if you look at the NAEP scores, children overall at all levels did much better. Wow. Wow. Um, also in chapter three, you're talking about accountability, and I know you've already sort of addressed accountability, but uh, uh, address the, the, the accountability that you're talking about in chapter three. Yeah, in chapter three, I, I deal with it. it, it uh, what it means is that having the will when things are not going right to hold anyone and everyone, especially, especially those who lead accountable for doing the right thing. If not, then we really need to displace them from whatever office they're in. You know, it happens on the school level, uh, you know, and it needs to happen at, at, at every level. School systems that work really, really well, there was accountability at every, every level, such that they support the schools, they support the kids, and they support the parents. And uh, too often, that's not the case. Too often in schools and school systems, the school systems, there there was a great chasm between types of schools, and because that chasm exists, 
And that means that those, those accountability measures are often very skewed to make it seem as if some schools are failing and some schools are not. And that very often is not the case. Wow. Chapter four, you talk about reopening and resocialization. Um, what should that look like? You know, uh, the good thing is that President Biden is addressing the, uh, the reopening piece uh, in a very succinct manner. Uh, it's gonna roll out into different states. It may vary some from state to state, but the good thing is he does have a comprehensive plan in place where there was not one. So that's, that's the big plus. So let me talk more about resocialization. Um, and not just for, for, stu for students, but for teachers and those who work at the school site. Um, everyone has an emotional bank, an emotional bank account. And all day long, folk make withdrawals and deposits from that bank account. And what happens is that, particularly now, because teachers, in fact, there was a study done in Canada, um, and it said that the, that the virus, the, the pandemic, is adversely affecting women more than men, and, and the, because the measure they use tests empathy. And I can't think of a group of pe people that are more empathetic than teachers. And not that administrators don't care, but, but teachers have that, that special gift to care beyond uh, the, the point of, of what they should. And because they care a whole lot, uh, that means that their emotional bank is often uh, withdrawn. They may have withdrawals uh, made quite a bit. So they come to work every day and they function with insufficient emotional funds. And they do a great job still every day. So that means that I suggest that we have as much support for our teachers uh, from an emotional standpoint as we do for our children. Children will get it because of IDEA law and and some other things. Now, as I mentioned earlier, I do suggest in the book that on every campus, particularly where students are under-resourced academically and socially, there needs to be a cadre of people, social workers, psychologists, um, uh, counselors, behavior interventionists, and those that support students who, who are having uh, issues with trauma. And even, even before COVID hit, the research on uh, students who are under-resourced ac academically and socially suggested that most of them suffer for, from P PTSD. So they needed their support a, a, a while back, particularly now since COVID-19, it's important that they both get that type of support. Not that other schools don't, but it's clear that it doesn't, it, it affected some schools as it, as it affected some neighborhoods more than others. Wow, we've got a question. Um... I, and I believe it's probably a teacher. It said, what do you tell teachers that are thinking of leaving the profession post-COVID-19? That's, that's a great question. And uh, Ivy, there were a lot of people, teachers, superintendents, principals, at every level that are asking themselves that same question, what should they do in, in the context, in the wake of, in the lieu of COVID-19? So my answer would be to uh, look in the mirror, as Michael Jackson said, the man in the mirror, and have an honest talk with yourself. And if teaching really is your passion and not just the position that you have, um, then uh, follow your head and your heart. If it's just a position, then you know you, you might lead. You know, and in, in, in the book, I talk about the continuum of leadership where you go from procedural, which is position, to conception, which is passion. The same thing applies to teachers. Uh, and you know, if that's your passion, then you then you hang in, in there, hang in there and do it. One of the best examples of passion uh, is the passion of Christ. You know, he told the truth and the truth got him killed. Telling the truth got Martin Jr. King, Martin King Jr. killed. You know, so um, passion allows you to go past where you feel comfortable to do. Wow. So follow your passion. Right. Chapter five, you talk about the call to action, the clarion call to action. Yes, what ma'am. What's the next step? The next step for us as uh, a country, as a nation, as a school system and, and individuals is to, uh, to coin John Lewis's phrase, start getting into good trouble. Uh, time is, and as I mentioned, you know, in November, our country pressed the reset button. And now we are repositioned to do some great things in our profession and in our country as well. It would be a shame for us to have pushed the reset button to go back to things the way they were, because the way they were was not good for all children, period, all neighborhoods, period. So that clarion call 
is, 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 is a challenge to everyone to get involved in schools and school systems and, and do those things and to hold accountable for those people who are in charge, again, to do the right things and have the skill and the will to do what's right and right for, for all people. You know, throughout the, that's why the first quote in the book is unity is our strength and diversity is our power. Unity really is our strength. So if we come together, and that, that doesn't mean we all agree, but we agree on certain basic things. Like all children should have the opportunity to have, you know, access to an equal and uh, appropriate education. And that means that things should be done equitably. So that last chapter is a charge to everyone. Wow. Although I've at the end of every chapter, it's a reflection piece whereby they write how they feel, what they're going to do, and, uh, and, uh, and what they've learned. So every chapter challenges the reader to do the same thing. Wow, wonderful. Now let's talk a little bit about your second book, uh, More Than a Notion. And you wrote this book, why? You know, Ivy, as a, in my profession, there are practitioners and there are academicians. Uh, and uh, I love academicians because sometimes they do the necessary re research that we need to uh, get the job done. I set, as a principal, I set through a lot of professional development by people who were sometimes academicians. They had mm -hmm. theories and they had companies uh, based upon what they thought would work. But, you know, there, there was very little literature written by people who sat behind my desk, more specifically folk who had had my experience as, as a principal at a Title I school. So my leadership style was transformational, which means I believe in growing the folk around me and paying it forward. So that book was birthed out of me wanting to grow people to have success at schools sometimes where um, students were challenged. And there, there is a method for that. I make the case in the first chapter regarding leadership, the principalship, particularly, that the principalship is just like being a doctor. You know, lawyers go to school for eight years and they get a chance to practice law. Doctors go to school for eight years, they get a chance to practice medicine. We don't get a chance to practice with, with children. We have to get it right the first time. So what I suggest is that principals are kind of in two camps. You have those who are general practitioners. That means that there are schools where kids uh, from, come from, you know, middle class parents. They, they have social norms. They have, you know, pretty much an academic background. And then you have principals who work in schools that were schools children challenge. And I suggest that those are like specialists because that's a different skill set to run a school like that than it is to run a different kind of school. So I talk about how to develop that skill set and that skill set can be developed. I spend a lot of time talking about emotional intelligence because, you know, and, and that score can grow, but that, that means growing the, the individual in a rounded sort of way to know where those pitfalls are. And not that other schools don't have problems, but the problems that we have tend to be more aggressive, tend to be more constant. And that's why folk who sometimes sit behind my desk at schools like mine tend to have problems like high blood pressure, hypertension, diabetes, all those side effects, because we, we develop, and I talk about that in the book, vices and virtues. So I devote a whole chapter to the, what's called the balancing act, how to, to balance the vicissitudes of the principalship when things all, it seems as everything is going wrong. So that book, it was written from my heart, but there, there was a lot of research-based information in there. And uh, so it, it, it's a very good book. I'm excited about the book coming out. I really am. I'm excited about this book, but the book that's coming out really is a book that everyone who was a school leader or who was an aspiring school leader really needs to get. I was amazed when they did the reviews for the book. I had some superintendents to, to read the book. And because uh, I was writing it just from a principal standpoint, they suggested that the book should be for all school leaders at every level. So uh, it's going to be released in April. We're going to start doing pre-sales next month. That's a book that every school leader needs on his or her shelf. Wow. Got another question here. Wow. Um, and I guess it's along the same lines. How do you create an atmosphere of enthusiasm around teaching and learning and uh, I'm not sure what that is. Anyway, the fears and the worries of the teacher and the administrators during the pandemic environment. 
Let me talk about that on, on a couple of levels. Uh, research by uh, Ho and Ho out of uh, Ohio State suggests that academic optimism and academic efficacy is a stronger indicator for uh, increased student achievement than is socioeconomic status, which means that when teachers trust those who lead and parents trust teachers, then that means that efficacy and student achievement is very, very high. And the way to develop trust as a principal from a teacher to from by from a, a principal to a teacher uh, is by principals uh, being consistent and getting problems solved very very quickly, uh, for making competent decisions, for doing the things that are right, even though it may not be sometimes uh, the correct thing to do, but doing what's right for your folk on your campus uh, and your teachers and your children. Same thing with parents. If parents really trust the, their, the, the person who's teaching their children, you know, then uh, the enthusiasm will, 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 will inevitably be there. I work at a school, uh, I'm fortunate to work at a very school, at a school in Florida. And when that kid gets off the bus or comes in, before that kid gets to class, he or she is told good morning by at least five people. So imagine the kid who wakes up in the morning and mama doesn't say good morning, you know, no one to say good morning, but he gets off the bus, he gets out of the car before he gets to class, five folks saying good morning, that increases trust. Same thing with, 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 with principals and, and parents and, and teachers and paraprofessionals, everyone. You know, um, there was a saying at one time, as is the principal, so is the school. And we have to model those things that we want to see happen at our school, even wow. when you don't feel like it. Wow. Got another question here. Um, provide some examples of skill sets needed for principals who work in a Title I school. Wow. I'm, okay, now you're getting into the second book, and I, I really, I'm, I'm going to talk some about it, but I really want to give you a cliffhanger because uh, I want them to get it. But let me, let me, let me just go back again, say that, that, that that's a different skill set. Um, one of the things that uh, that principals that work in schools, uh, like the one that I worked at and most, most of America has, is that uh, they have to have uh, know themselves, not just uh, their skills, but the characteristics that, that support those skills. It means knowing their emotional self and their personality first. Because you can't grow anybody unless you know yourself first. So that right. means what I suggest uh, a personality inventory, because uh, the skills can be developed. But along with that, I talk about the wheel, and they both kind of go hand in hand. Uh, some that I found to be very good with true colors. Um, um, one of the, the, the courtesy test, a uh, courtesy test. And what it does, it tells you what your personality is. And so you find your refinement areas and your reinforcement areas, we call them strengths and weaknesses. It's important to know that so you'll know what areas that you're strong in and what areas that you need support in. Because at a schools like that, it's important that you have to build a team. And when you build a team, you build a team based upon those things that you cannot do and where they have strengths at. That's the first thing. Because at, school, it, at some schools, sometimes principals can get by with just being a one-man show. At Title I schools, that, that, can, that, that happens to your detriment. So in order to build that team, you first have to know yourself. And when you know yourself, then you grow the folk around you. So you build that type of capacity. Part of that is also having, uh, I talk about in the first chapter, emotional intelligence. Knowing your EI score, your EI score can be uh, increased. And it, 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 the way that comes into play, if your emotional intelligence score, which, which can again can be improved, it's not really high when those problems come across your desk or in your face and sometimes they start before, the, before school starts, then everything that happens will frazzle you. And you know you, you will develop, and I talk about that in the book, a vice or a virtue. And what happens is sometimes the pendulum swings one way or the other. It's important to have a good balance between vices and virtues because you have to have a healthy self. Uh, one of the things I talk about is data. Now, let me go real slow right here because I know we have educators on the line. One of the big things in our profession is, uh, is data-driven. 
data drives this and data drives everything. And what we should be doing is making using data to make informed decisions. Now, that's not a novel idea, but it's what we should be doing. For instance, I went to my doctor a while back because I have sugar diabetes and some other things. My doctor asked me how I was doing. I told him I was doing fine, but he ran blood tests. Those blood tests he used to determine what type of medication I was going to take, and he made an informed decision based on not just what I said, but those tests. As educators, we should be doing the same thing. When we say the data drives everything, then it absolves us from being responsible for doing the right things for all children all the time. It's easy to say, well, the data said, well, you know, little, little Susie or Taquan or Shaquan cannot read. So we'll just treat them accordingly and we'll, we'll let them do phonics or, or some lower level thing. And we just let them make sounds and maybe they'll read. Well, you know, truth to be told, uh, if, if the, data, the data on me said that I came from a single parent, uh, by today's qualification, I'd be considered homeless because I grew up in the house with my grandparents. And but uh, because my mother had the, the will and the compunction not to let the data drive what it suggested, you know, my brother was now an attorney and I'm doing reasonably well because that didn't dictate where we went. And so often in our profession, we let the data drive things and we lose good students and good teachers all the time because we don't use the data to make informed decisions. The other thing I talk about uh, in, in the chapter, and I'm, I'm, again, I'm not giving you the whole ball of wax, but is uh, how to handle problems. Basically, every problem is adaptive, which means it deals with systems. Uh, no, people, adaptive is people. Technical is systems. And every now and then is a combination of both. And so when folk come to us with problems, when we realize that, that the problem is not with us, it's either with another person or a system or sometimes both, then we can deal with the problem wearing, wearing like a loose garment. And we can handle problems like they're very, very easy. So it means knowing how to handle problems when they come to you. It means knowing how to use data. It means knowing how to grow the, the folk around you. And it means knowing how to build trust uh, within the community. Wow. And those are all skill sets that can be developed. Wow. Uh, how much of an impact do you think COVID has had on the education community? Uh, the sad thing, Ivy, is I don't think, uh, I don't think I know. The true impact won't be told for years to come. We know there is an immediate impact in that uh, it has already adversely affected uh, some community more than others and some schools more than others. Uh, and uh, the sad thing is, because again of, of accountability, um, those that control uh, the powers that be, and you know, education is really controlled by politicians. Educators really don't control education. In some states, um, they're still testing. And that's why my, my hat goes and my heart goes out to teachers who are, and, and administrators, I'm not discounting administrators, but I, I see folk who are teaching hi hybrid, some kids there and some kids, you know, in the classroom. Um, and and, and when, it, when it first started, we had a, a, a bunch of different things going on. Some were traditional, some were remote, and then there was a, a different definition of remote versus virtual, you know, and then... You know, we didn't know if we were going to use one screen or two screens. There was nothing. There was no comprehensive plan. And as was, I'm telling you, as a result, uh, there will be a lot of people who will leave at the end of this year if they haven't left already. That's going to be the immediate impact. And the other thing is, and again, I mentioned testing. Um, most kids in schools like the one I serve um, get test anxiety anyhow. In fact, a lot of kids do. To have kids test. And have teachers get, get ready for tests in this season, so to speak, is um, unconscionable, uh, unfair, and it's, it's, it's almost unethical. Now, I know there needs to be some measure of what, what student, students have done. I believe in accountability. Uh, so I don't, I don't mean to, to state that we shouldn't be unaccountable, but it needs to be based on uh, true variables for where kids are versus where kids are going. And not measure just apples to oranges, but measure apples to apples and oranges to oranges. And the sad thing is, very often in my profession, we measure apples to oranges. Wow. Got and a question. The truth is, but the truth is, Ivy, the other thing is the, the, the true context of uh, how it has affected my profession will be told years from now.
And that's the sad truth. Wow. Got a question for you. Um, accountability is a major theme in your book. How do we hold everyone accountable? Uh, by looking at the results. Wow. And that's, that's, that's the bottom line. But looking, looking at the results. Again, when I went to my doctor, I told him I was feeling good. I'd lost 11 pounds. I was feeling good. Blood pressure was low, but he still ran those darn blood tests because he wanted to see the results. And wow. we have to look at the results. If the results, if, if we have a school system and some schools are doing just really, really well and some schools are not, then we have to ask ourselves, what are the results saying to us? And be honest about those results and then make the changes accordingly mm -hmm. and hold ourselves and pa parents need to, and, and again, it happens more in some communities than others, but it means getting the support to get those things done. And I'm pretty sure an educator, um, a teacher would probably ask, how do you get the parents involved? Trust. You know, some, some of my best uh, teachers were those that built bridges of trust with their parents. Uh, and it meant they communicated with them all the time, even when it was unpleasant. And parents trusted them. It means becoming a part of the community. You know, there was a time in, in, in our communities, and I use that word because we have uh, devolved from community to neighborhood to, to hood, and which is not a good thing. But, you know, we can, that can be restored uh, right. if, we, if we have, again, the will to communicate at, at every level. So it means parents building bridges of trust with, with, with teachers building bridges of trust with parents. It means uh, principals building bridges of trust with teachers. And it means um, superintendents and those that work on that level, building bridges of trust with the community, bringing business partners in to work with schools such that we don't just have one size fits all. And those schools that need the most help, get the most help and get the most resources. Um, and because, you know, the, that's why I, I put the quote in the book, having and having our schools results in having and having our communities. You know, those, there was no reason why if there are businesses here, they shouldn't be linked to schools that, that, that need the support to get it. Mm -hmm. I cite the, the last chapter in the book in the reframing of, of, of American education, I cite Alberto Cavallo, who's the superintendent of Miami-Dade County, been there 12, 13 years. Uh, and he has done some remarkable things, but they aren't earth shattering things. And the things that he's done is for his, and he, he took the school from a D district to an A district. But he's done some things by making sure that all his schools have access to those things that need to be successful. He's married the business community with the schools. So each school has a component that reflects the, the businesses, in that, businesses in that community. And it's, it's, it's been successful. And that, that's not a novel idea. It's just mm -hmm. doing what's right and right and righteous for all children. It can be done. You stated early that um, educators don't really have control of education. You said that. I'm um, so glad you brought that point up. I was glad you circled back and got there. Well, the question is, this present administration, do you think they are going to offer a hope and help? Or do, do you think things will just remain the same? Well, let me say hope is not a strategy, uh, but they are going to offer help. And uh, let me, and I guess in a short sum, sort of way, explain the way our system works. Uh, the chief counsel of school and state operating officers, which is a branch of the governors. Governors really control education. And um, the, the government, uh, the president and his, the secretary of education makes recommendations and they, they uh, make broad plans. But what really runs that are the governors and politicians. They make the moves that decide what happens. For instance, you know, when the schools were... Um, segregated, in order to become uh, desegregated, there was a law. That, 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 was a, that was a political thing. That's why in both books, I frame it, I couch the book, uh, both books in the four frames of education. The humanistic frame, the structure frame, the symbolic frame, and the political frame. The political frame is one that we don't talk about in education because most of us shy away from it. But it's the frame that we should be the most involved in. You know, when I was a principal, I used to tell my, my teachers all the time, if, if NEA and uh, LFT 
and some of those other alphabet organizations ever got together and decided to do the right thing, we could change education. But politicians know that our, our profession is fractured and divided. So they make laws. Sometimes, as I mentioned with, you know, with the, with the, with the, with the test, that are not, that don't involve many of us. And so when things happen, it's we're not uh, to, to our uh, good, it's to our detriment. Wow. So that can change. Let me say it quickly. That can change <laughs> because uh -huh. those people are voted in and out. And then, you know, because that's why I keep mentioning our, in November, our, our, we pushed the reset button all over the country. And we're repositioned now to do some things. That needs to happen all of the time. Wow. Um, if anybody else have, has any other questions, feel free to put them in the comment box and we will ask them. Um, I understand that you work as a turnaround specialist and you have started your own company as a leadership development coach. Uh, what is the difference between the two and how do your books fit the theme of these or fit in the scheme of things rather? Boy, that's a long question, but I'm, I'm going to tackle it. <laughs> I am so very blessed and fortunate to have the distinct opportunity and pleasure to work for the Rensselaerville Institute. The Rensselaerville Institute is, uh, and that, that's why I serve as a turnaround specialist. It's been around for uh, about 16, 17 years. It has two sides of the house. One is results, the other one is school turnaround. And uh, in fact, the president of, of the Risk of the Institute right now is Mildred Tolliver, who is uh, who has worked in Shreveport for a long time, made it with Shreveport. Uh, and she is the president. And I get a chance to work, work with some amazing people who, does, who do some amazing things. And basically what it is, when schools, to make a long story short, when schools, can't make their growth or performance score because, you know, we have the alphabets now. Uh, they call companies like mine in, the one I work for in, to turn those schools around. We work with principals, uh, basically principals for about two years, uh, and we uh, help them set targets, realistic targets, so that uh, students can grow and teachers can grow. And uh, we make sure that they meet those targets. And in 17 years, our company has not missed working with them, not has not missed a target with the school at all. Uh, we, we have six turnaround characteristics and six, uh, six turnaround principles and six turn turnaround characteristics that we work with principles on. And uh, it, it, it is a very rewarding job. I'm very fortunate to be able to do that. The first, uh, and that, that the book that would probably fit that would be uh, the reframing book because it's, it's a book, I wrote that book for everybody. So that's, that's, a, that's a real general book. Um, the passing gym leadership, when I retired, I knew I was not going to retire well. So about three or four years before I retired, I uh, was fortunate to get uh, in Seton Hall's doctoral program. And when I finished my doctorate, I started my own company and uh, didn't do much with it because I was again, forced to be hired by TRI. Uh, but of late, I've, I've done some things. I've built a website and again, launched two books. And, uh, you know, um, I focus not so much on schools that need to be turned around, but in growing leaders, period. Because the truth is, uh, leaders at every, every level can use help and support. And so that's, that's what the, the second book and the first book both talk about. Uh, I would suppose and I imagine that it probably would fit the second book in that I really concentrate on principals who are working with students who are uh, under-resourced academic and socially. Uh, because in most schools like that, you know, we have teachers who are brand spanking new, which means training teachers. And that's a, you know, that's a whole other skill set. You know, so I, I have a passion for doing that. And, uh, you know, so uh, that's that's how those those two roll out. Got a question for you. You, mentioned, <laughs> you mentioned earlier that uh, one size does not fit all. Please expand on that idea. Oh, I'm glad you asked that question. I'm so glad you asked that question. In my profession, we are really good about doing one thing and applying it to every school. We do, we, we roll out a program and the program goes to every school. And whether they need it or not, you, they get it. And that's not, you know, we don't, we don't wear the same shoes, 
We don't have the same pants size. We don't have the same dress size. Why in the heck would we roll out one thing for everybody? It needs to be individualized. It needs to be specialized. We need to have the latitude to do what, the, you know, and that's why sometimes I got in trouble as a principal. I did what was right for my school. Some things the system did, I just didn't do. I'm in trouble now, but, you know, so that's okay. But, you know, we have to, our profession has to get past that. In some places they are, you know, so um, we, uh, my profession has to do better about that. And that's why in the book I talk about that, but that can change, Ivy, again, if we hold the folk accountable that make those decisions, which are those people in power, politicians, those who lead schools at, at high levels, it means holding all of them accountable. You know, so uh, that can change. What's the difference between these two books? Because they sort of seem to kind of coincide with each other, but then yeah. yet they... There, 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 there's, the, 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 uh, the first book I wrote, which was, which was actually more than a notion, is written specifically for school people. It's written specifically for those who lead schools or those who are aspiring leaders. Uh, so those are the folks that actually um, need that book. Uh, and, you know, at college professors, I've shopped this into some university professors uh, because they, they can use that, that book as well, too, for their leadership courses. This, the book that's out now, which is really the second book I wrote, but the first book that came out, is really a book I, re I wrote for anybody and everybody, pastors, preachers, politicians, principals, parents, you name it, that book is written for everybody because unity really is our strength and diversity really is our power. Everyone has to get involved to make things happen and get it done. Um, it's an easy read. Uh, the book, More Than Notion, it has, has a little more academic language in it, a, little more, a lot more research in it, uh, so it's a little tougher read, uh, but it has, it has a lot of solutions in it as well. So uh, the, the, the book that's out now really is a book for everyone, and that, that book should be on, on everybody's shelf, period, because it really is a call to action for us to do better about education than what's going on right now. Uh, how can the library play, play a part in, in all of this? You know, and thank you so much. You guys already have. You guys have purchased copies of the book in there in, in every library. So if you're in Shreveport, uh, go to your local library and you can get, you can check the book out and read it. Uh, if you if you can't, can't get to the library, you can uh, go to Amazon and Barnes Noble and anywhere fine books are sold or my website, www.passiongenerallyleadership.org. You can order the book there. Um, as I mentioned, the, the second book, More Than Notion, won't be, won't be released until April, but, that, but you, can, you can do pre-sale, pre-orders, beginning next, beginning next month. But uh, More Than Notion, uh, if they want it, they can go, I mean, of the reframe, they can go to the library right now uh, and get it. Got another question for you. Sure. Do you think themes and proposals are also important in higher education? <laughs> wow. Okay. I wasn't going to say it until you brought it up, but let me just say, uh, one of the things, I don't talk about this in, in, in more than a notion, but in the reframe of education, I do talk about, there's a section I talk about, uh, particularly HBCUs. Mm -hmm. Uh, let me go real slow right here. Let me say that my mom went to HBCU. I love HBCUs. I wish I had gone to one. It's just that when I was going to school, I needed scholarship money, and I couldn't get enough scholarship money to go. But I, I believe with all my heart that the research, I'm, I'm going to answer two ways. The research that needs to be done, should be done, on what works and does not work, in schools where children are challenged academically and socially should be done and must be done, particularly and first and foremost by HBCUs. Now, I'm not saying it's done on, you know, it's not being done, but on a more aggressive level, it needs to be done. Uh, in terms of accountability, yes, accountability should be, should be done there as well. Uh, sometimes it's hard because of the way uh, the, the system is done for higher, higher ed. But until uh, those that have positions of power are able to make the changes in the classroom so that teachers are teaching uh, methods and pedagogical things so that students can come out and aptly deal with the population that we have now, then those changes might not happen. But it means giving those people the power to make those changes. 
you know, and here again, you know, we, we uh, have the power to, to actually get those things, things done. Wow. Got another question for you. I was trying not to say that, but I just said it in here. <laughs> what are your thoughts about mentoring, mentoring uh, young men to steer them towards careers in education? You know, I'm a real rip opponent of, of paying it forward. Um, as I promised myself when, when I became a principal that I would grow the folk around me and, uh, and make sure that they were on a path for continued growth and that they would pay it forward and, and grow the folk around them. Uh, as a result, a lot of teachers have their grad school that was at the school that I was at or now uh, principals or instructional coordinators or working in district office or some even in the state department. I believe that's really important. And unfortunately, not enough of us pay it forward and, and, and mentor those folks that, that need to be mentored. Um, it's really important that we have, that we develop the mindset to do that. Um, the last guy, when I was retiring, I had a passion for growing up, particularly guys who look like me in the profession. And I had the distinct honor of serving, but being an adjunct at, uh, at Grandland when they had all, when they, an all-star all program when we would go to schools and work with, uh, work with teachers. And there was a young man there, I'm not gonna call his name, his name is Van Phillips. And he was working at a school in, in a different parish, doing a great, great job. And, and I saw the potential in Van. And uh, Van, I, I, I teased him and coaxed him until he came to work at uh, my school, well, my former school uh, in Caddo Parish. And Van is now one of the premier uh, people in our profession. I mean, he's, he's, you name it, he's there on social media. He's doing great things in the classroom. Um, but I did that because part of, of my passion is, is paying it forward and growing, and growing the people who, who can continue to make lifelong changes in our profession. Wow. I think we're going to just about get ready to wrap up. If you have any questions, be sure to uh, put them in the chat box and we'll try to get them answered for you. Um, once again, ladies and gentlemen, um, the Shree Memorial Library author chat takes place each first Thursday of every month and we talk about different issues. And tonight we're talking to Dr. Tyrone Burton about education. And I believe we do have one other question and that says, uh, how do you engage in self-care because being a leader in education is super challenging? Ivy, I devote a whole chapter to that in the book that's coming out. It's called The Balancing Act. Mm -hmm. I wrote that chapter because I was the worst at it. Uh, I was, uh, I got lost in uh, being the principal. I didn't know who Tyrone was. And uh, I had to make the conscious, it, it really, it took somebody close to me, literally chopping me in my throat, literally, bam and making me come to the realization that I had to do more than just school. I would spend hours at school and I was a really, really good principal, but I'm not sure if I was a really, really good dad. Now my sons would probably disagree, but uh, when I finally decided to do things and find Tyrone again and take care of Tyrone, uh, then I became a better principal. But it took me hitting rock bottom uh, personally to make the conscious decision to do it. Um, you know, so to, to, the short answer is, it means being intentional about taking care of yourself. You know, if you are, uh, if, if, you're, if you're a lady, you know, just keeping those nails appointments, nail appointments, get those toes done, hair done, take yourself shopping. I personally like, uh, uh, I like a shopping therapy. You know, retail therapy is one of my favorite things to do. I love to shop myself. It means spoiling yourself. And the thing is, there is nothing wrong with spoiling yourself. And it, it goes back to the thing I talked about, about the, the emotional bank. You know, we operate with insufficient emotional funds so much until we, we, we are on emotional empty. You know, I, I make the statement in, uh, in one of the books that uh, unfortunately folk in my profession have learned to function in the system of dysfunctionality and we make it look good. And, you know, but it means those of us intentionally taking time for ourselves. 
and realizing that we owe it to ourselves to do that. Wow. And with that, I believe we're going to wrap this evening up. Ladies and gentlemen, we would like to thank you for joining us. Well, one other thing, uh, uh, Tyrone, tell us where uh, they can uh, pick up both of these wonderful books. And um, thank you for asking. When you, this one will be out. <laughs> uh, the, more of the notion will be released in uh, April. I'm going to have a virtual book launch. So be looking forward. There will be events. I'll do podcasts and master classes leading up to that. Um, the book that's currently out, The Reframing of American Education, you can get, at, you can order on Amazon, you can order Barnes & Noble, or anywhere where fine books are sold. And you can go to my website, www.passiondrivenleadership.org, and order it there. So go get your books, and uh, they're, they're going fast. So be sure and get one. I promise you, you will uh, you, you, you'll get some great information from it. And you can also check this one out at Shree Memorial Library. Ladies yes, you and can. Too. Thank you guys for joining us tonight. And remember, uh, the Shree Memorial Library author chat takes place each first Thursday of every month. Um, coming up next month, we're going to have a brand new author and we're going to talk about uh, that particular author's book. And we look forward to seeing you guys next month. <laughs>